fun. Okay, so here's the AQA GCC teaching love in. First section, living world. And here we have number one, the ecosystem. Obviously, ecosystems are a, an area of certain scale within which abiotic, non-living things like water, sunlight, etc., provide a landscape for biotic things, plants and animals. And they then interact in an area and you get various different pieces of language we need to learn. So we're going to go through uh, this section on ecosystems and I'm going to use the BBC Bite Size page because anyone can access it um, and therefore you don't need to worry about where you are. So first of all, the definition of an ecosystem, just giving it to you, you'll find that if you click on any of these links, it gives you clearer definitions. Remember, we're talking about biotic flora and fauna, animals and plants, and abiotic, non-living things. Remembering that flora and fauna are a big mix. You've got a lot of biology to do to, to add in there. Don't throw away your biology when you're, you're studying this part of your GCSE geography. So the abiotic is probably more important to spot out. The climate, climate determines the temperature regime. Remember some places you've got massive seasons, so you may have frozen ground for a couple of months in the year, and that acts to kill off a lot of the fauna, and that will reduce the uh, growing cycle and the growing season. And in some places, the ground is frozen almost throughout the whole year. Up in the northern areas of Siberia and Alaska, you'll get something called permafrost, where the ground is frozen, and only the top layer melts in the summer, and then, um, refreezes again and that has an impact on water logging and what happens so that takes us to the soil the soil is where the nutrients that have been decomposed into the ground forming organic matter that stuff that humus as it's called not to be confused with chickpeas from greece that's hummus humus is a black sticky stuff which allows water to be able to dissolve nutrients which allows plants to take them up through a process known as root uptake back to your biology and obviously water is very important CO2 plus H2O gives you glucose plus oxygen, photosynthesis, not just for biology. So here it is in its simplest form. You've got the soil, nutrients taken up by the plants, herbivores can eat the plants, of course, and then, of course, you get all kinds of things can eat plants. Uh, that's a cow, by the way. Uh, cows don't have many predators. Just thought I'd point that out. I'll return to that in a moment. So the ecosystem is then uh, brought apart and has various processes in it. And you need to know a UK example. Here is a pond in Calm, I think, in Wiltshire. So this is a single ecosystem which we're looking at. And we're talking about a pond which has some organic matter at the edge. So you can see abiotic stuff is water and energy coming in. And within it, you've got a lot of biological activity. There's a little diagram to show you an idealized view of a pond. And you can see down here, nutrient rich material where dead organisms have fallen below to the bottom. And we've got then decomposition going on in an anaerobic area, no oxygen. That organic matter will give rise to uh, aquatic plants, plants that live with the sunlight coming in and the nutrients below, and they provide havens for different kinds of pond life. And you've got scavengers. You've then got in the midwater, you've got uh, different kinds of flies and nymphs and larvae which can be eaten by fish that looks like a pike personally but of course you'll have different pike different size of fish sorry small fish like sticklebacks may be eaten by big fish and they may be picked off by herons and the heron or the kingfisher of course isn't just in that closed system of the the pond because they can fly somewhere else die and be decomposed somewhere else but broadly speaking we're looking at a quite a closed system apart from the energy coming in and the water coming down a lot of that is, is for you to get your head around. It's all very straightforward. But it just shows how the pond has got five different layers. The bottom of the pond with scavengers and water worms and rat-tailed maggots. Midwater where the fish predators are nibbling on the nymphs and things and dragonfly larvae. The pond surface where you've got oxygen now which is breathable and you have some, some plants, sorry, some uh, fauna which can survive in the upper areas just floating on the surface, water boatmen. And of course they provide nutrition for things not ducks ducks are herbivorous and they'll tend to eat um, pond weed that scatters around there then on the edges we've got the pond margin the edge where the bulrushes appear you've got survive and they don't mind having their roots permanently in the water and then above the pond we've got the things like the kingfishers and the insects that buzz around and also when they die and fall in they fall and they decompose and they off we go with our ecosystem with nutrients now all ecosystems have got food webs but to explain the food web first, you've got to understand the food chain. The food chain is really easy. These things down here are uh, decomposed material. But if you've got plants that are producing organic matter via that process of photosynthesis, they're known as producers, 
Whereas anything that consumes already made biomass, anything, is a consumer. And you can see in a food chain that the fish eats the caddis fly, which is itself fed on the algae. And then if, if it's unlucky, the fish gets eaten by the kingfisher. But only in very, very cold places or dry places will you find food chains. So, for example, you may find them in uh, Antarctica and the Arctic, and you may find them in hot deserts. The reason for that is usually there are plenty of different niche conditions, the small scale conditions that mean certain different types of uh, fauna can survive. And here's a good example of a food web. So down at the bottom, detritus algae can be eaten by and form the basis for these guys. These aren't producers, of course. They don't photosynthesis. They have to consume via um, cons uh, producers down below. But above them, you've got more complex bugs, insects, etc. And the important thing to point out now is in a food web, a caddisfly can substitute. It can eat more than one thing. But the best example of that would be a fish. The fish can eat many, many different things. So, for example, if the dragonfly dies out, it can substitute for caddisfly and stonefly. And that word substitution is very, very important. And equally, your kingfisher isn't picky. It doesn't eat just one species of pond fish. It can substitute between others. And that's very important when we look at how we can disturb ecosystems. Because a food chain means if you chop off access to one um, consumer or one lower level pro producer, your whole food chain is going to be erupted. But actually, we have food webs, so substitution allows upper predators to be able to survive. Now remember, when you go up from one level to another level within food webs, only 10% of the energy of whatever's been eaten is converted into new biomass. 90% of the energy is used for just respiration and movement and catching prey. Okay, so how do we interrupt our ecosystems? So that's us humans, we do it deliberately, but there are natural factors as well. Don't forget the natural factors. Reduction in rainwater, too much water, natural fire and disease can interrupt, selectively interrupt the niches. So, for example, many animals can't survive without water. It's only things like toads that are quite happy to, to be able to adapt to that. So that would de destroy their niche conditions and they'd have to adapt. And how do humans do it? Well, just think of a cow in a field. A cow in a field is just a cow munching on grass and other bits of uh, producers that are there. There's no predator on top. You don't find your random cat bounding onto a field and hanging off the back of a cow going, get down, I want to eat you. Oh no, it'll have its whiskers and its soup, feeling soup, thank you very much. So humans can add different uh, species. They can also drain the land to change the nature of the ecosystem, to change the abiotic nature of the ecosystem. They can change the pH. They can do that by adding materials to uh, the soils. And pH or the acidity, which you've learned about hopefully in biology, that is really important because uh, especially fish, they can only survive in a small range of acid conditions. And finally, this is a big one, the word eutrophication. This is when humans add fertilizers to a landscape and it artificially stimulates the growth of one part of the ecosystem. The problem with that is that, for example, in our pond, if we get nitrates flooding onto our pond, it can cause algae on the surface to grow. That blocks out the sunlight, which means that the aquatic plants can't grow and everything that relies on those producers dies. And also when the algae dies, it falls to the bottom. Suddenly you've got lovely decomposers say, yummy, yummy, yummy. They take oxygen out of the water, though, which may affect the fish and the mid-pond level. So just be aware of that big word, eutrophication. You drop the eutrophication bomb in an exam, and your examiner can mark it and move on thinking you're a god. Okay, if we move up a scale, when the climate or the abiotic factors are, are obviously regional scale, like a hot desert or tropical rainforest, then you're going to get a, a large-scale recognisable set of plants and animals. In other words, in deserts, you know what true deserts look like. You're not going to find big baob, well, you are. You're not going to find big mahogany trees. Uh, and you're not going to find oak trees. You're going to find brush, and you'll, you'll find the occasional uh, plant which is adapted to it. And these climatic regions broadly associated with latitude, which is important, of course, for determining the temperature and the seasonality. And they're, then because of pressure, then you'll get different kinds of rainfall regime. If I drop down to this diagram, a bit difficult for you to get your head around, but an important thing is that we have different climatic regions which determine different types of biome. And those different biomes, you again, you may be familiar with them, are really well represented on that map, which is a simplification of Kirpin's climatic classification system, and is shown down here. Here is a list of them. Just learn the basics of those, and there they are as a diagram. Nice and easy, that's ecosystems.